Bill Harris, in any political career, there are high points and low points. Uh, in yours, what was absolutely the decision that you made that you are most proud of? My service in my first term of the last, uh, first two years of the last four years, it wasn't easy. But we legislated a regional transportation authority for not only the city of Chicago, but also the other five counties circling uh, Cook County. It wasn't easy, but we busted that baby through, and we are the envy of many, many major cities of the United States. Now, the Regional Transportation Authority may not be perfect, but it's better than most of the other mass transit systems in the United States. Bill Rock, your toughest decision? Toughest decision? I, I, I'm not sure. I think probably in 1900 and 1981, when uh, when uh, Jim Thompson challenged uh, us as Democrats and me as the leader, right after on the heels of the Ronald Reagan presidential victory, that uh, that uh, they were going to take over the operation of the state senate. Looking forward, of course, to the reapportionment. Uh, uh, that was a difficult few weeks, and uh, I finally uh, made the decision that we were going to just take them head on, and uh, that's what we did. It was a very kind of a nasty time in uh, my political life. Governor Edgar, toughest decision? Well, I think uh, the, the toughest part of the job was the death penalty because uh, there you're dealing with a human life, and it's very personal. I mean, it's one person. Uh, I have no regrets in the decisions. I think I had about 11 cases, and the one I did commute. Uh, fortunately, the, those that came to me I felt were pretty clear cut, but still, uh, when you know you're the last person standing between uh, someone and execution, that is a uh, very sobering experience to go through. Uh, you know, I had other times when probably I was frustrated for a, a short period of time, but none of them compared to the, the responsibility when you're dealing with a, a person's life. If you were governor, would you have made the same decision that George Ryan recently made? Uh, issuing a moratorium on the death penalty? I, don't, I haven't seen all the information. I think it's reasonable to say let's pause and take a look because of one case. I mean, I'm not as a, the fact there have been many overturned on appeals to me indicates the system works. There was the one case, though, that was just a few days from execution, and then they found someone else who admitted guilt, and that wasn't the process that found it. That was a bunch of law students. That. I think is alone is enough to cause let's pause and take a look at it and uh, see what we need to do to, to provide the safeguards. When a Republican governor like George Ryan makes a decision like that, uh, he, he, he infuriates some members of his core very conservative base. Do you think in reality, are, are we at a point where a Republican governor will never go back, that we will never reinstitute? the death penalty in the state of Illinois, because politically it will be very, almost impossible for a Republican governor ever to cross over that line again. I'm not sure I follow you, Bruce. We did, they didn't do away with the death penalty. No, they just said we're pausing. The, the pausing, but I'm, I'm just saying, is, is, is that pause going to be a permanent pause uh, because of political consideration? I would be, I, you never know. I would say that, no, it's a pause. They're going to try to take a look. I mean, that, I made it very clear. He. And I think that's different now. If he would say, we're not going to have the death penalty, that's a different position than what I understood he took. He took, say, we're going to pause and right. take a look and see if we need to strengthen the safeguards in that system. Right. But I don't think the suggestion was that we were going to do away with the death penalty. Uh, I think public opinion in this state still supports it. I think there was, though, public support that we ought to take a look at it, make sure the necessary safeguards are there. Yeah, I was just suggesting that 
that although he did not suggest that, I'm suggesting for the sake of my question is that because of the politics of it, is that going to be a permanent pause? I, I, I got to tell you, I never viewed the death penalty as a partisan political issue. Now, I, I call a lot of flack too when I commuted the one uh, mm -hmm. sentence, but uh, mm -hmm. that that's too important even to give it thought about partisan politics on. Governor Stratton, your toughest decision mm -hmm. as the governor of the state of Illinois, what was the toughest decision you ever had to make? <laughs> that's a tough question. <laughs> you have you never know when you're going to be called upon to have to make a very serious and, uh, decision involving even matters of life and death. And so it's uh, not an easy spot to be in. And of course you try to avoid that position as much as you can. I'm not so sure that I would favor one person having to make some of those decisions. I think perhaps uh, we could find a way that there could be an effect the committee do it or an authority rather than just a single person. Now that may be dodging the bullet, but it's uh, something to think about. How would you feel if some day you had to uh, make a decision that cost a human life? not easy. Don't ever try it. <laughs> Phil Rock, when you uh, stepped down uh, as the president of the Senate, did not run for re-election, there was great speculation that you would run for higher office at some point uh, in the future. Uh, have you ruled out running for higher office? Yes, for good? Pretty, pretty much. How uh, come? I, uh, I, I thought at one point that I would uh, dearly love to declare my candidacy and run for the Illinois Supreme Court. I think for an attorney that's the uh, that's Mount Olympus of the, our profession and I would like to try to get there. Uh, I, I have had serious second thoughts about standing for re-election to or election to virtually any office these days. Uh, a couple of reasons. One is the the total invasion of privacy and, and the, the scrutiny to which one must subjugate not only him and her, himself and his wife or herself and her husband, uh, but the family and, and uh, business uh, relationships and so forth. Uh, I, I, all too often in the past probably four or five years at least, I, I've seen uh, uh, not only myself, but I've seen uh, other people undergo a change in their thinking. They're, not, they're just simply not interested in standing for public uh, office. Uh, part of the reason is that. Part of the reason is the absolute negativism that's out there. I mean, we are no, so concerned now about poll results and focus groups and opposition research and, and <laughs> it just, if you, if you start looking at, at the political system, uh, with all those component parts, you say, my goodness sake, why would anybody want to do that? And that, unfortunately, is kind of where I am. I, I, my kids are grown and gone and, and doing well, and uh, life is very uh, comfortable and nice, and I come and go as I please, and uh, I kind of like it that way. Jim Edgar, you've had a uh, little time out of the uh, hot spotlight, and yet there are some people in the last several months who I have heard in Springfield suggest that Maybe in the future it's uh, time for a Jim Edgar comeback. Any likelihood? Brenda? <laughs> <laughs> Would Talk, someone please uh, pick Brenda up on the floor, please? <laughs> I, you know, I had a great opportunity. I was in the political governmental reign for 30 years, and I got to be the, uh, the governor, which is the highest honor in this state can be bestowed upon you. And in some ways, I guess I got there earlier than others and, and got done earlier than others. Uh, I, I don't think political life is, or jobs are lifetime jobs, and I think that uh, eight years as governor, for me, uh, I was able to get done most of what I wanted to get done. I felt the state was in good shape. That was a good time to, to exit. Uh, there are other offices at the time, the U.S. Senate, uh, probably 20 years ago, if I hadn't been governor, I'd have, I'd have jumped at that. But uh, you know, I just felt like 30 years was a, a good amount of time, and I wanted to go out while things were good shape, um, go out, as they say, on top, and I, I felt like I did that. Now, I have 
absolutely no plans to go back. And I think people who know me know that I plan and plot everything out for years. Uh, but I, I did enjoy during the last gubernatorial campaign to point out that both of the gubernatorial candidates are older than I am. And you never say never in politics. No, but uh, I'd check with Brenda first. Senator uh, Harris. I would like to just take a little personal privilege and share with this audience brilliance sitting in the office of governor. Bill Stratton got a call from Orville Hodge on the press, George Thiem's um, stories had shaken Illinois. And Orville called the governor and said, Bill, I want to come over and talk to you. And this man, Bill Stratton, immediately dialed and talked to the then Attorney General Latham Castle and said, Orville wants to see me. I'd like to have you here with me when he arrives. Latham Castle immediately dictated a, and uh, not surrender, but uh, plea. Fold it, put it in his vest pocket, and those two men sat and worked with this man who was totally undone. And everybody loved Orville. There's no question about that. And the conclusion of that meeting, General Castle handed his confession to the governor the governor sent, handled it to Orville. That's thinking fast and accurately. And the people of Illinois did not have to put up with an awful lot of dirty linen. And isn't that wonderful service? Governor Stratton, can you uh, elaborate uh, on, uh, on that? I, I appreciate that. Can you elaborate on uh, what Bill Harris just had to say? Well, I just want to thank him for his graciousness, and those are tough decisions, but you shouldn't run for governor and be elected unless you're ready. And I always thought I was ready. So, uh, Amen. Not, not to be, not to be uh, ungracious. On the gracious side, I think, the families of governors, particularly, I know in my case, my beautiful wife, Shirley, has been all the help in the world to me. I couldn't have continued on this course that I took over the years if it hadn't been for Shirley's inspiration. And I want her to know it publicly. I'm sure she appreciates it. We have uh, questions uh, from the audience. Uh, also, I encourage everyone uh, who wants to ask a direct question uh, to move to the microphones. We will take your question in just a moment. We also have written questions, and here is one for uh, Senator Phil Rock. How do you think the increased power of the four legislative leaders has affected the legislative process? Phil? I think the increased power of the, the legislative leaders has come literally from, from two, different, uh, two different sources. One is obviously the political process, where the leadership has assumed a role that at one time it didn't have, and that is to be literally the kind of omnibus campaign manager for all their candidates and incumbents. And then secondarily, I think that uh, as literally as the fruit of the labor of many who went before them, the fact that now the General Assembly is, is virtually, if, if not uh, in actuality, a, a real equal partner of the executive and judicial branch, that, that obviously that, that authority is, is, is now vested. And you have things like, uh, as we were talking at the table, member initiative appropriations and that kind of stuff that was unheard of in our day. Uh, I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, 
Uh, I'm a little concerned about the political part because what I, what I see happening, unfortunately, is that there appears to be, and this is an appearance, I am not directly involved anymore, but it appears that there is an absolute breakdown of, of party loyalty and party discipline, uh, which I think will ultimately be det detrimental. If you have 100 free agents out there running around, uh, you're simply not going to be as effective as if you have some kind of consensus building. And, and, and I think that, that also uh, that, kind of, that kind of concentration of power and effort unfortunately seems to lead to some of the, what I consider to be uh, negative sides of this, negative campaigning, uh, polling, focus groups, opposition research, and, and all, all aimed at literally election or re-election. And it seems to me, and, and, and we, we, oft, we, we have to, and those of us who are in the legislature should, kind of move this up a, a step and say, okay, we've got the tools, we've got the ability, we've got the staff, we've got the people, now we have to govern. It just seems to me that everything these days, because of this concentration of power, is aimed at election or re-election, and we have forgotten what the business of government is, and that is business of politics is, and that is to govern. We're, we're not governing. Is, is we have a question good? from uh, the audience. I have a question first. Okay. We, we, we have to take to one thank, from, Go ahead. I wanted to thank our friend down there for his kind remarks a few, uh, little while ago in, the, in that particular case. Okay. You're, you're, you're certainly one of my idols. We have a question in the audience. How possible would it be to restructure the revenue system for the state in such a way as to reduce the gross disparities in revenues that localities have that are based on their uh, property tax, uh, differences in their property tax basis? Is there a chance for income tax, sales tax, any, any reform in this system? Governor Edgar? <laughs> <laughs> Well, as I say, I wouldn't bet the farm that you're going to see uh, any serious movement to, to shift away from property tax reliance toward, let's say, the income tax. Uh, I think we, we reached our high point in uh, June of uh, 1997, but unfortunately Senator Harris was not the Senate president to call the bill. Uh, I, I just, my sense is that won't happen. I mean, the only major shift I think you could have away probably be the income tax increase. And the legislature, um, ever since the defeat of uh, Governor Ogilvie, has been extremely uh, afraid of touching that, even though uh, there was the temporary increase in the income tax, which we made permanent my first year as governor. I, I just don't see that happen in the near future. I, I think you'd have to have a change in the makeup of the leadership in Springfield. and. Uh, I don't see that happening in the near future either. We have another question here. This is for uh, Senator Rock and for Governor Edgar. Uh, what was your secret in working with Senator Pate Phillip? <laughs> <laughs> was you, there, you, you, you go you first, want to tell Phil. us his secret? You go secret? first, Phil. I want to hear it. <laughs> Phil? Oh, gosh. Well, I, don't, I don't know that there was any secret. I think it's fair to say that Pate and I have been friends for 20 years, and, sure. and uh, I knew him before he assumed his high position, and we got along well then. And uh, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that when I was the leader, uh, I treated him with fairness and even-handedness, and I, we get along fine. That's not to say we always agree, obviously, but we get <laughs> along. Uh, you, can, you can in this business. Uh, I hope everybody understands uh, really be in a position of disagreement without being totally disagreeable. You don't have to get mad at one another. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, even after those times that Peyton and I did get mad at one another, we quickly uh, settled our differences and sometimes it helps, moved so. ahead. Well, sometimes it's an effective uh, tool. <laughs> Let them know you're not going to be uh, stepped on. Well, Senator Phillip and I came from kind of different factions in the party. I mean, I'd worked for Bob Blair, which made me suspect to him right away. Uh, I always viewed him as a Neanderthal. Uh, I mean, and so when, probably when we came together, and you know, we had dealings, but when I became governor, uh, there was probably some, there's some questions. But I have to say that in many occasions, I had no better ally than Pate. Uh, that first session, I mean, I'll never forget when we got him to get up and make a speech why we got to make the income tax permanent. 
to help school teachers. I mean, I just hope they have that on tape someplace. Uh, but Senator Phillip, you know, the, in the media, there would be times I wanted to strangle him, and I'm sure there was times he wanted to strangle me, because philosophically, we were different spectrums of the Republican Party. Uh, he is conservative, and he makes no bones about it. He's very oriented toward DePage County. Uh, as governor, uh, I worried about the entire state and probably more of a moderate. Uh, but one thing about Senator Phillip, uh, more, I, you know, I, I don't think he gets the credit. Senator Phillip often will speak his mind. I mean, what he really believes in. It's not all politics to him. Uh, I might disagree with his personal position, but he does speak it and he does take that position, and uh, I respect him for that. Uh, also, we got into a little bit about the four leaders and the power they have. The Republican Senate caucus uh, is probably the, is more of a democracy. Uh, sometimes I thought it was chaotic democracy, uh, but it, it is more of a democracy. I mean, the, the members actually, Pate doesn't tell the members what to do. Uh, the members often convince Pate what to do. And I don't, I think he gets sometimes blamed for everything that people think's wrong that comes out of that caucus. I think often Pate is reflecting what the majority of his members feel. Now, uh, Pate is, uh, is Pate. Uh, is, that's what they always told me when I'd ask him, why is he doing it? They just said, that's Pate. But again, I will, I'll go back to what Phil said too, though. Uh, he can be a very good friend, he can, and he can be very supportive and loyal. Uh, but if he disagrees with you, it doesn't matter who you are, he's going to tell you and probably tell the media too. A lot has been said and written over the last uh, you know, couple of years about the, the, the difference between your style of government, and governing rather, and uh, George Ryan's. And a lot of it is based on, on the different personal styles. A lot was said the number of times that the governor worked the floor, uh, the parties at the mansion, uh, uh, you know, uh, going out to dinner on a regular basis, a much more social, hands-on uh, governing style, which differed from yours. Uh, speak to us a little bit about your style and, and whether or not you think some of the criticism of that style is justified. Well, first of all, you're talking about, I guess, dealing with the legislature. And there is more in state government than the legislature. There's more to being governor than dealing with the legislature. The governor is the chief executive. The governor has to manage the state. And when I became a ninth governor in 1991, I mean, there were some very serious management problems. The state was broke. Uh, and we then were facing a recession. Uh, so I, I guess I always felt, Bruce, I was hands-on. It didn't mean I spent all my time with the legislature. That's true. Uh, but uh, there's a lot more being governor than just you know, spending time with the legislature. Legislature is important, but I firmly believe that it's probably more important what happens in those state agencies as far as delivering service to the people than maybe what happens in the legislative process. Let me give you one example. Perhaps one of the major crises we faced in the 90s was child abuse, not just in Illinois, but throughout the nation. I mean, the breakdown of the family structure had resulted in uh, tens of thousands of children being abused and neglected. Uh, that was a concern in state government. We got, a, a, you know, attacked by the media, and rightfully so in some cases. Uh, but I think today, Illinois is one of the leaders in that area. Now, that, I think, has a lot more to do with what happened within the executive branch, and particularly what happened in the Department of Children and Family Services than maybe legislation that passed. Legislation is important, but the people who run those various agencies and what they do day in and day out, I think is really the most important part of state government. We haven't touched on that in this whole discussion today. Jess McDonald came in as director of Children and Family Services and I think uh, had a huge impact on Illinois being able to improve the services for children uh, in this state who've been abused and neglected. Uh, and that is one of the responsibilities of the governor to worry about what's going on in those agencies, put the right people in. And throughout the 90s, we had some like crisis after crisis that uh, I feel like we handled pretty well. Uh, the voters, I think, thought we handled it pretty well. So I know that we maybe didn't spend as much money, make as many deals as some would like, but I think with what we had to work with, uh, I think we handled it pretty well. And again, my style was you know, making sure that our managerial responsibilities, making sure the departments worked, the laws were carried out, which I think uh, sometimes the media has a tendency 
uh, to, to forget about. Because the legislature is, the legislative process is a lot more fun, it's a lot more interesting than some of the day-to-day -day administration of state government. But I think that's very important, and that's kind of where we had to concentrate uh, during much of the 90s. Phil Rock, your association, when you were the president of the Senate, you were working with uh, Jim Thompson, and he represented the other style, at least the style insofar as uh, a lot of activity with the, the lawmakers in a, in a legislative way, in a social way in many cases. Uh, can you comment on what Governor Edgar had to say in context with sort of the uh, the milieu in which you worked in Springfield with with a governor of a different style? Yeah, well, I, I, th I think as long as it's recognized as a different style, there is no one style for this kind of operation. Uh, Jim Thompson was a very engaging individual and, and had a lot of ideas and, and uh, used to call from time to time to uh, bounce ideas off people and, and, and get some feedback as to what, you know, will, it, will this fly or will this not fly? And I happen to be one of those that, uh, uh, that he used to call upon from time to time, and, and we'd uh, share a cup of coffee or a beer or something and, and chat about state government. So I had the opportunity, literally, yeah, to work on a less formal basis. Now, that recognized the fact that, as he did and I did, particularly since 1981 when he had that constitutional assault on the General Assembly, on the Senate in particular, uh, that, that we were constitutionally in an adversary position. That, uh, he's the executive and we're the legislature, and, and, and there, there has to be some natural tension there. And we were from two different political parties, so that doubled the tension. Uh, the fact is that uh, he recognized and did not wish to be uh, having seen what happened during the Walker administration, he did not wish to be overly confrontational. He wanted to be, as most of us do, loved by everybody out there, no matter what his idea was. And so he, he, he consulted a lot more than, than perhaps uh, uh, Jim Edgar did at, at the time. But it was a different, uh, a, a different time, and, and, and he, was, he was able to uh, put forth some, some major initiatives, not, uh, you know, Build Illinois, which is the, uh, the literally the, the, the father of uh, Illinois First or whatever this new program is called. Uh, those kinds of initiatives were as a result of this consultation, and I was part of the consultation. And he, uh, it's not, and he did the same thing, I'm sure, with the House leadership. We should also mention that uh, Governor uh, Jim Thompson and Governor Dan Walker were invited to participate in this forum today, but they uh, declined uh, the invitation. We have another question from the audience. Uh, when is this state ever going to get to the point when they deal with the disparity in the cost of education throughout this state so that we have quality, equal education? If we don't do something with revenue, none of that's going to happen. In the meanwhile, nobody's addressing it at all. And I think it's a disgrace that we have a disparity between something like $43,000 per child to $14,000 per child. No matter how many exams you give the kids, it's not going to come out even. So I think it's something that the state has to address and has to address quickly. Senator Harris, you want to comment on that? No. <laughs> Bill Rocky? No, well, seriously. I, 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 frankly, Bill, I, I, the first time I heard that, uh, that uh, call for, for uh, action, from Edna was back, I think, Edna in 1970 when I was running for my first uh, first term, and we were on the West Side together. And she made that uh, pointed out this disparity between spending in school districts on behalf of kids, and I said that's not right. We should do something about that, and I still believe that. Uh, and, and I don't think it's fair to say it's been ignored. I, I think we've made tremendous strides. The General Assembly and the governor have made tremendous strides in dealing with. Uh, education, particularly elementary and secondary education in this state. But the fundamental problem is the one that Doris brought up before and, and the one that uh, nobody wants to come to grips with, and that is when you have this over-reliance on the property tax, it's just simply not going to work. It's, it, it can't. It, the, the nature of the beast is it won't let it work. And so until we confront that, uh, we, we're going to have kind of a Band-Aid approach and I suggest, particularly with an economy this good, and when we're all in fat city, you're never going to address a subject like that. It's just uh, nobody wants to talk about raising taxes, even if there's going to be a corresponding decrease on the other side. It just it simply won't happen. 
So and I, you know, I appreciate the fact that you're still uh, carrying the message for all of us who are believers. And uh, yeah, it's a long haul. And we're getting closer, though. I think the disparity between the expenditures in the districts you'll find is significantly less percentage-wise than it was when we started this crusade. I don't. Uh, let me just add. I, it, that has happened. I don't think you're ever going to get to the point where you're probably going to have uh, the same amount of money as long as you have local control schools. But uh, one of the things we did get done, which I think is the most significant, more significant than maybe the shift in the tax, is the foundation level. Setting a, a foundation level that the Eikenberry Commission felt was a reasonable amount of money for a minimal quality education of $4,250. Three years, that goes up. It's now time for the legislature to take a look at that figure and see if it needs to be adjusted up again. Uh, that required about a $500 million increase in taxes in 1997, which was not easy, but it was a tax increase that went to education to try to help the poor school districts. And so I, I do think we've made progress. I'm a, I would love to tell you that in 10 years we're going to have this problem completely eliminated. I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think that steps have been taken. We need to continue to take steps dealing with that foundation level to make sure that uh, we begin to... Uh, assure no matter where a child goes to school, at least they're going to have a number of dollars available so they can have teachers to teach courses so they can get into state universities. And that wasn't true before.